please join me in welcoming Charlton and Ruha to the Strand. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And quickly, I need to ask you a favor, which is where the clicker is. You got it? OK. I need it. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. <clears throat> all right. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, thanks to The Strand. Uh, great to have a great fanfare opening and introduction. Uh, great to see folks that I haven't seen in a while and uh, some uh, friendly faces. Um, and thank you for your interest in, uh, in the book. So I wanted to start off uh, tonight, and before I go on, I should also say a very uh, a great thank you to my colleague, Ruha Benjamin, um, who agreed to come out and do this uh, with me tonight. And I'm gonna do a little bit to talk about the book, give you a little bit of a background, uh, sort of frame it, sketch it out a little bit for you, and then uh, Dr. Benjamin's gonna come and grill me for a little bit and uh, get some more out. And then we'll uh, transfer it over to the audience for some Q&A, uh, and then we'll see what happens. So I like to call the story about the book, one book, two stories, and a little cocaine. All right, always a great evening when you get to talk about a little cocaine. Um, <clears throat> but black software was, for me, a, a roller coaster uh, ride. That is, unlike most of the books and the work I'm used to doing, I did not start off with uh, a thesis that I merely sought to confirm. Uh, I started out with a set of questions and then went where those questions led me. Uh, and often those questions led me on a journey that uh, was a little bit uncomfortable, not so much because of the subject matter, though that was part of it, but mostly because I was unaccustomed to writing a book that ended up mostly historical. And for those of you that are familiar with history or writing history, you know it's easy, or at least easy for me, to get completely and utterly lost. Not something you want when you have a book due uh, in a matter of time. Um, so it, I spent a lot of time, A, figuring out what this book was about, uh, and then as I did, trying to figure out how to piece it together. And so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about for just a few minutes before we go into the uh, uh, interview part um, with Ruha and then to the Q&A. So all of this, of course, started for me with Black Lives Matter, um, a, a movement we're all familiar with, familiar with certainly its outcome, the power, its impact that it's made on our conversations, on our policies, on how we push for racial justice. And so this started off as uh, an endeavor to understand how did Black Lives Matter happen? Who were these people? How did they marshal digital tools to accomplish what they accomplished? And so I knew enough and wasn't naive enough to sort of stop and think, well, Black Lives Matter began in 2012 when the hashtag was created. And so I started off wanting to understand what is the genealogy? Where did they come from across a longer time horizon? And so I started where I thought this would all begin and frankly, where I thought it would all end, which was in the 1990s the birth of the web. And if you are familiar with the 1990s and the internet, um, if you're thinking about, let's say, 1994, and the conversation is about black folks and the internet, what are two terms you most likely will end up talking about? I know there are folks in the room as old as I am, so. Anyone, anyone? The digital divide, right? 
We talked about black folks as people who did not have access to the internet, who were not online, and therefore had no reason for us to consider who they were. And so this number 5.2 million represents the number of African Americans who owned a computer at home and were online in 1995. And so the question arose for me, who are this 5.2 million? Most of our history talks about the numbers that weren't represented here. And we say then that there was nothing that these people contributed because they weren't online, they did not have access, nothing important for us to consider. But I wanted to know who these 5.2 million people were. And my investigation into that led to what is in the book now called Book One, the first story. And it is this question that once was a chapter title in an earlier version of the book, somehow got discarded. Um, remember when the internet was black. And so rather than explain what that is, I wanna read a short passage about a couple of people that helped me to understand why I could make such a statement, ask such a question, what it would mean to say that the internet was black in 1994. <clears throat> David was the approaching middle-aged lawyer. Malcolm was a young geek. David took the lead. His vision was dead on. But Malcolm was there to remind David that his execution his proposal lacked, well, a kind of technological charm. Malcolm says, we suddenly realized that the idea of a network of black culture was an opportunity. The two tossed around potential names for the venture that began exploding in their minds. Afronet was the first out of the gate. They ruled it out. They discovered that a company with the name already existed, selling hair nets. Not to mention, Malcolm also pointed out that an online service named Afronet already existed. Malcolm suggested cyber black. David squashed it. Too hard, he said. I could have easily gone down the path of trying to be this blacker than black service, but then I had to say, hold it. We're about to enter the 21st century and it's gonna be about communication. It's about creating a place for people to talk, debate, and have fun. To me, the business model of the next century is about inclusion. Then it happened in tandem. Malcolm said, net. David said, noir. Then Malcolm and David walked into Redgate Communications, sat in front of Ted Leonsis, uh, for those of you who don't know, Ted Leonsis was the, uh, the marketing manager at the time for a little company called America Online. Then Malcolm and David walked into Redgate, sat in front of Leonsis and a young, now larger than life entrepreneur who sat on top of the online world. Not phased by celebrity, wealth, or the fact that Leonsis stood to make or break their dreams, David and Malcolm made their pitch. Net Noir, what was it? What could it be? Why should it exist? How would they do it and what made them think they could be successful? David and Malcolm laid it all out for Leonsis. And then they walked away from that meeting confident. But they were realists. They knew theirs was a shot in the dark. They had applied to Leonsis' greenhouse program just like 1,700 other individuals, teams, and companies vying for America Online's money, marketing, and home within its online portal. There were 1,700 other people also convinced that their idea could work. The story then, of course, ends. I'll give away a little bit of the ending with Ted Leonsis, who remarks later, with these kinds of endeavors, you bet the jockeys and not the horse they're riding. They both showed up for the pitch meeting and they were able to articulate with a gleam in their eye exactly what they're going to do. Having a gateway to the entirety of Afrocentric, uh, Afrocentric culture was appealing. More than that, they were more appealing as a team. They could have come in and sold us anything. 
I knew in the first 15 minutes I was going to do this deal. And so book one is, in many respects, a celebration, not just of that moment, that moment that ends up with Net Noir becoming the first um, online platform, essentially, that brings people and introduces people to this new thing that we called the internet. And to think that all of that was premised on the sale, the distribution, the connection with the valuing of black culture. And so this is book one, celebratory um, for all that it accomplished and celebratory for all of the people along the way throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s who in some way brought this to fruition. <clears throat> Eventually, however, I made another discovery, and I won't talk about, or maybe it'll come up a little bit later, how this discovery came about, but it ended up with a story that I decided I could not not tell. And for all of the celebration, for all the revelry in the discovery, if you will, of these folks' stories like David and Malcolm uh, and many others that I talk about in the book, there was also a cautionary tale, and that is what ended up being book two. <laughs> On Friday, August 6, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson stood at a Capitol Rotunda podium, poised to sign the most far-reaching and impactful civil rights legislation in history. Civil rights leaders from Rosa Parks to Reverend King, Ralph David Abernathy, and others looked on, smiling triumphantly. They were hopeful about the future. The president had signed the Voting Rights Act into law. By stroke of a presidential pen, black people had seized and secured the greatest power ever at their disposal, the franchise. Just four days earlier, however, the U.S. Department of Labor began the week turning out a relatively uncelebrated news release. The weekly news digest regularly filled itself with the problem of Negro employment. The August 2nd edition, authored by U.S. Labor Secretary W. Willard Wirtz, led with this headline, Heads-On Collision Course for Civil Rights and Automation. The news, re the news release proffered two immutable truths. Call it automation, cybernation, or age of the robots, the technological revolution is here and here to stay. Call it civil rights, or equal opportunity, or peaceable free protest for freedom now. It is equally evident that the new Negro revolution is here. These lines faded into the long shadow cast by the end of the week's voting rights victory. Johnson was privileged to pay in full one of America's long overdue promissory notes, but his labor secretary ended his weekly memo with this cryptic reality check, saying there are machines now which can play excellent game of checkers and they can play pretty good games of chess. They can play a fair hand of bridge, they can interpret books. They are doing in good many ways skilled as well as unskilled jobs in the economy. They have no hands, but they can tabulate checks and they make no mistakes. They have no eyes and yet they watch over the industrial processes without ever blinking. It has taken only 30 years to move from the fantasy of Rossum's universal robot to the reality of UNIVAC and its brother computers. And today's reality is more fantastic than the fiction of the 1920s. To some, word, Wirtz's words read like a primer on the day's advances in computerization and artificial intelligence, but they were not. Wirtz offered a prescient declaration about where the ne Negro stood in comparison to the Times' quote-unquote thinking machines. When the U.S. government predicted the collision between civil rights revolution and the computer revolution, it did not imagine a fender bender that left both equally damaged. It imagined a, co a collision that left the computer revolution unscathed and the civil rights revolution twisted and mangled up within it. Why did this collision and its predicted outcome seem so inevitable? 
And I felt like I had to tell this story in book two in part because of the way the celebratory story in book one collectively ended. That is, that too, its end of book one seemed inevitable. And inevitable because of what had happened, what had started to take place 50 years earlier. And I want to end my opening remarks with a little bit more on that, tying these two books together, which ultimately became uh, a trick in itself. How to link book one, book two, especially knowing, as I did, and realizing that uh, I could not tell story one without telling story two, and vice versa. So I promised a little bit of cocaine. My wife is here, she's always maintained, I don't know why that cocaine stuff is in your book. <laughs> but <clears throat> in the 1980s, Silicon Valley heralded the second high-tech revolution. From its Bay Area core, the region radiates outward from Stanford University to the west and up to Daly City, down past San Jose and over to Hayward. It was named for invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. The region had long ago played midwife to industry. It helped to birth the microchip, ARPANET, disk drives, and the personal computer. But in the 1980s, cocaine was the valley's newest, purest, most preferred, and best distributed high-tech curio. You see, the valley sold dreams. It's sprawling intellectual and industrial spaces, including its Stanford-connected labs and government-sponsored research centers provided a new frontier for imagination to wander. Each fed the impulse to build new tools with which to master the universe. Its financiers capitalized investment in its fantasies. The new tools brought to market in droves provided the satisfaction that comes from dreams not deferred. Cocaine was tailor-made to fit the Valley's technological and entrepreneurial ethos, its daily grind, its demand to create value, its pervasive drive to succeed, its capacity to aspire. And I use cocaine and its rampant use in Silicon Valley in the 80s to, to, to invoke an analogy with a different kind of technology that we're familiar with. And so thinking about cocaine and thinking about a chemical technology, something a little bit different than the hard uh, hardware, the software, the cables that we think of when we think of uh, about computers and how these things were racialized, right? And so we know the end of this story that begins in Silicon Valley, takes a route down the coast of California, ends up in Los Angeles, transformed into crack cocaine, spread across the rest of the country, and we're well familiar with the devastation. And so using this as an analogy, for what I mean by black software and the ways that we mobilize technology for different reasons uh, to affect different communities based on race and other differences in different ways. I will stop there. Thank you. Testing, testing. Good evening, everyone. It's really my honor to be here in conversation, this labor of love. Um, the, the words that were um, re reverberating as I read were words that aren't actually quoted in the book, but Audre Lorde, um, when she says that if I didn't, didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me. And I was thinking about how this labor of love is a reclamation of definition of what actually happened and what can happen. And in many ways, it's getting us to rethink the relationship between blackness and technology away from the kind of deficit model, pathology, digital divide. But it's not simply kind of substituting a techno-utopianism, a black version of techno-utopianism for the white version. It's kind of complicated our understanding about, as you say, the relationship between the civil rights movement and the computer revolution. And so I would really encourage everyone to read it, to teach it, and to share it with family and friends because it is, um, it is a, a, a different way of thinking about what, what actually happened and its implications today. So in many ways, you answered my first question, which was this two-for-one book that we have. You know, it's like two books in one. And so you can't go wrong. And my experience 
with editors is often they, they force you to decide which book you're going to write. Like the, the, the advice for many writers is like, there's two books going on here, and you need to decide. But here you've somehow managed to keep both in, but really m get the reader to understand you can't tell one story without the other. And I feel like um, your intro here really gave us an understanding of your thought process for that. So let me jump to my second question, which is that, um, as your preface said, this started out as a book about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And it, and you followed the story. Um, and so can you just give us a little sense of that shift from realizing what you had intended, the initial question, and where you ended up? Yes, thank you. Um, so again, I, you know, I wanted to understand sort of where Black Lives Matter came from, uh, its antecedents. And part of that was noticing on platforms like Twitter and Facebook and others that, um, you know, this, weren't, this wasn't just folks who decided I'm going to jump on Twitter one day and make the revolution happen. Uh, these were folks who had particular kinds of expertise, facility with the technology, and I wanted to know where that came from. And I had a sense that, um, you know, while some of these were young people, not exclusively, and whether they were young or whether we're talking about a couple of generations, there was a sense in which this expertise was transferred to make this possible. So that's what started me on the journey. And then it was uh, being willing to follow the story. So I did not expect to find the folks that I found um, in the 90s. Some of them I did. Um, but I think it was a, there was a turning point with a guy named William Morell. I asked all these folks the same question when I first started out. I said, simply, when did you first get online? I thought I knew the answer to that question. Internet was born in 1994. It's got to be somewhere around there. William answered the question and sort of said, ah, you know, um, mm, about 1978. And I wondered, what on earth could you mean by being online in 1978? And I must ask you that question and go wherever it leads. And what it led to was this longer trajectory that turned my question from just uh, what explains Black Lives Matter to what is the long relationship of black people and blackness to technology? And I felt that if I could answer that question, I would answer the question about how Black Lives Matter came to be. Awesome. So that describes one aha moment. And I wonder if there were uh, one or two more that you wanted to share with us. I'll tell you one section that really jumped out at me was the conversation or the discussion about IBM and Watts. Partly it's because I'm a, a South Central, um, you know, raised. But also my associations with IBM were with South African apartheid, Holocaust. And so now to bring it to, um, you know, Watts was a, a a different sort of geography of what 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 this was. Yep, that was my next big aha moment, and it was the moment when, after William, I said, "Look, we're back in 1978 now. If I allow myself to go further back, I'm guessing I will find something." Though I didn't know what I would find, and as I ventured back, the first thing I happened upon was this documentary, Watts, Riot, or Revolt. And it started off as a documentary about Watts, which I was familiar with, I knew about, and so I just thought, all right, here's a documentary about Watts. And then after about 12 minutes in, there's the first opening for the product placement, and out jumps this big emblem of IBM sponsored by and so that was a first, like, oh boy, there's something else very much here, and I want to know how and why IBM ends up in the middle of the watch riots yeah. and what that's all about. Um, and that was sort of the first step into the whole rest of what became um, book two yeah. that starts in 1960. Yeah, and so I think the the last question I'll um, I'll throw at you before we open things up is really thinking about the implications for the conversations around race and tech today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one kind of through line, um, both in book one and two, is the 
the force of capitalism, but a, a very particular articulation of black capitalism mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. There's a quote on 246, I'll just re read very briefly by one of your respondents that in some ways in, encapsulates the tension. Mm -hmm. um, David says, we all are a collective body. Let's all move forward, both on a global sense, macro sense, but also within these virtual communities. So black folks would just be able to finally improve our lives. That was certainly part of my thing, but I was definitely an entrepreneur. I am an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur in the sense that I intended to have a successful business and then get a return. I wanted to become wealthy enough to become comfortable to live the life I wanted to lead. And then it goes on with, with your analysis. And I was thinking about that particular articulation of it and just a through line in conversation with the calls for black tech investment today. Mm -hmm. Everything from the encouragement of black students to learn how to code, but the kind of tech fairs mm -hmm. that are Afro tech fairs and how this history um, can offer um, a, a complication and a caution for that, that particular path forward. Indeed, thanks for that. Um, so this is a great uh, question because it, A, brings in, you know, one of the, the characters of the book that I absolutely sort of gravitate to, mostly because he was so unabashed by the sense that, hey, the best way to do for my community is to do for, for myself, get rich, we'll be all on board to, to move forward. And frankly, I was surprised when I got to that moment. Of course, you know, I'm still with Black Lives Matter in the back of my mind, and so I'm asking folks about, uh, activism, political activism, and no one was talking about that. Mm -hmm. Everyone was talking about this is our moment mm -hmm. to take this new technology um, and drive it for our economic empowerment, our betterment for both individuals but also the collective. Mm -hmm. And so that was um, a, a collective um, dream that was the optimism that all of these folks were rolling with in some way, shape, or form, um, and it materialized um, for David, for many of them. Um, the interesting thing, of course, we all know is that it all ended, right? By the end of the 1990s, all of those entrepreneurial ventures started by black folks were, for the most part, gone. And so I think as we move ourselves up to the present moment, we have to ask ourselves the question, why was that the case? Why was it that all of these folks kind of vied for the attention because they seemingly knew we're not all going to win. There might be one of us. Um, and that structured a lot of what happened at that time. And so I think when we think about this entrepreneurial moment about capitalism today, it is, you know, this, this sort of sense of, you know, go big or go home, meaning if there is not massive capital investment in these kinds of technologies that black folks are trying to build, you know, it might be a slow failure, but failure is almost inevitable. And so I think that is the tale and the caution that if we're serious, then we've got to find serious ways to play on that playing field. Thank you for that. So now as we um, move to audience questions, the last kind of plug I'll make is that um, I would love to see this turned into a graphic novel. <laughs> and partly if you just consider that the two books, the main protagonists are The Vanguard in book one and The Committee Men in mm. book two. Doesn't that sound like, you know, really good graphic novel characters? Okay. Any, right. uh... <laughs> Any, anyone listening? <laughs> um, that will be your second edition. Indeed. All right. So let's turn things over. Do we have a roaming mic? All right. So there we go. Anyone? Stunned into silence. Mm -hmm. I have more. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Theo, and Hi, Theo. I'm at the AI Now Institute, so we are neighbors. Indeed. Uh, I just wanted to echo uh, your storytelling um, with the two stories um, really hit me, I think maybe because I'm writing my book right now, um, and the fact that you created this out of that tension and followed through on it, um, and the cocaine metaphor is so 
just profoundly brilliant and my um, brain is spinning, especially with California and Reaganomics. And the, that's the first laboratory for the prison industrial complex. Um, and you said the story ends um, where it begins. And I think you mean with the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. um, and that too is just this echo of the wreckage and catastrophe of Reaganomics in California and nationally. Um, and yeah. so my question, um, I just, I'm in awe, so. I, um, my you. question <laughs> is, um, um, if you, uh, your archives, I wanted to ask about your archives, and I looked through your citations um, and the newspapers that you looked at and these other modes of stere uh, storytelling mm -hmm. that were beyond the white utopianism of Silicon Valley in California. Um, and what were some of the most powerful newspaper outlets um, for your storytelling? Yeah. Thank you um, for all of that, and thank you for the, the question. Um, there were there were many of them, and of course, you know, when we talk about the archives for this book, that includes the, sort of the stories from all the folks that are still living um, and with whom I formed relationships and talked to um, most of the folks m multiple times, uh, and so their stories that are kind of on the record. But then, uh, particularly as we move back, you know, newspapers, etc., some other archives, government archives, and so forth. Uh, I think the the torch, if I'm getting that right, I'm, my memory is failing me. The MIT student newspaper was an, a profoundly interesting one, particularly in telling that story in book two. Again, looking at, you know, what we've been told is that in the 1960s, you had the civil rights movement and you had the development of computing, and these were two parallel things going on that these had nothing to do with each other. And so part of what I wanted to do was demystify that narrative. Um, and one of the first and profound places to do that was in, um, not the torch, uh, the tech. That makes more sense. Um, the tech newspaper, where there, were, there was a lot of uh, conversation about these two things, about civil rights, what was going on on picket lines, what students were involving, involving themselves in, in Cambridge and the wider Boston community, and then um, building this new technological society at which MIT was very much part of the, the forefront. Um, and so I think in those pages, pages were one of the most sort of profound set of archives because you could see how people were grappling or not grappling with this intersection at the time. There are many more, but I'll stop there. <laughs> and to read those sections with what's happening at MIT right now oh, in yeah. the last year, it, it talk about echoes. And Indeed. What institutions fail to reckon with. Charles, and thank hey. you for the, your stories. Thank you. So your, I love your book, Race Appeal, and its impact on race and politics. And I'm looking forward to reading this book. Thank so you. how do you, can you con make any connection between what you learned in Race Appeal to black software and uh, how d it will impact our youth, especially with technology, you know, telephones and mm -hmm. some of the social media that my 14-year-old is dealing with <laughs> today? Yeah, I'll try that one. <laughs> um, Race Appeal was um, a book about African-American candidates and how they fare in uh, political election contests. And if I would say there's a through line between these two books, it's about um, the incredible power of representation. That is, I should say it the other way around, the devastation that comes from the lack of representation, whether we're talking about government or the technology industry. And so here we have a case where underrepresentation, the lack of uh, black voices, women's voices, people of color's voices, and how we will, how will we build, um, what technologies will we build, for what reasons, none of us had a part in that conversation. 
1960 through 1970 and you know very much not uh, much since then and we see the devastation that that decision wrought from the 1970s, 60s, and 70s up to uh, the present. And so I think when we think about today's tech industry, we have to ask ourselves the same question, many questions, but at the very least, what is the lack of representation in the industry from top to bottom, um, both commercial companies, higher ed institutions, others, government that are connected, what will this underrepresentation reveal itself as 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, and ask ourselves, do we want that? Hi, I don't know exactly how to frame the question, but in thinking or um, in hearing you all talk, I'm thinking about um, kind of your passage going from Black Lives Matter to then the Afronet and thinking about the counterculture movement that kind of where a lot of the internet was coming out of um, and them kind of thinking about this in this like techno utopian kind of tool. But then even before that of um, radical software collective thinking about video technology and that being a tool for more voices to kind of get elevated and um, not be so much of this is what the institution or whatever the government wants us to think, but this is our way of communicating our own voices. And so thinking about going from um, radical software and then coming back to Black Lives Matter, this is a tool that people are using with Twitter and they have their own phones and they're able to disperse kind of everything that's going on in the streets and then thinking about also this documentary I recently saw called Who Streets. And so there's just power of be people being able to be on the street and sharing their stories. I see this kind of um, thing circle, circling around the book, and I didn't know if you were finding these threads in your own research of counterculture movements and things like um, the Whole Earth Catalog and um, them bringing in Black, pa uh, Black Panthers and them giving them a chance to tell their story through the catalog that was huge mm -hmm. with hippies in the day, if you were seeing any of that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and that particular part of it, the sort of countercultural movement, didn't make it into the book. There was an earlier version that had um, a, a significant part of a chapter that was devoted to it. Um, but in part, what I saw, you know, so this is that 1960s moment. And from that countercultural movement, those who happened to have a voice at that time, it was a different kind of voice, right? And so this was, uh, these were folks who referred to themselves as gods, essentially, because they saw themselves as having profound power over the technology and that they could shape it to do and be whatever they wanted it to be. Uh, and so they proceeded in that way, and they may have separated themselves from the uh, from government, from powers that be, in principle, uh, to push back. But that pushback was still be it still began from a position of strength, of dominance. That hey, this is ours to take and do with what we will. When we bring that forward to the late 70s, early 80s, as you start to see these black communities form online and these um, uh, computer networks and so forth begin, um, it, was a, it was a different narrative. Number one, it was a, um, we're catching up. Number two, we're not coming from, at least in large part, a position of strength, we're coming from a uh, you know, the bottom, as it were. Uh, and that was significant, right? They're learning these tools that some of them got in tech school, some of them got working for the federal government, however they could, but they began to form this expertise and then start these long, larger ventures where their voices reverberated throughout these networks and uh, beyond. But I think those two things then are juxtaposed um, and highlight the sort of position structurally that we occupy within this system. Some from a position of power, and yes, I'm Twitter, I can amplify voices if I want to or silence others that I want. Um, and Black Lives Matter where I am in some ways dependent on these platforms to gain the kind of attention I need to build and to move forward a movement. Hi. 
friends. Hi, Carlton. Um, hey. So I haven't read it yet. Just bought it. Everyone, Thank you. It, it Thank looks you. great. It feels great in my Follow hand. Follow her lead. Uh, Oxford University Press does really beautiful books. Um, so, uh, so this is just like a tiny piece of the book that I see because I'm uh, working on some stuff in the er history of the early space program. Mm. So I'm just going to ask you questions about that because I'm very selfish. Sure. <laughs> um, and because I came across some interesting things like, um, I mean, so I see that there's a little bit in here about the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Mm -hmm. And so we know that there were black women working as you know, computing, doing calculations there. Mm -hmm. I also know from some also kind of university publications that there was pretty active pushes um, in those days around the space program, NASA, based on problems in South Africa, uh, basically segregation of um, space, US space program facilities there. And so students were actually pushing back in California. Mm -hmm. So that's a tiny little bit that I know, yep. about, it's not too much. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about NASA, Jet, Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, anything associations you have with that, and just kind of give us some insights on how that might fit in with all this. Sure. That, I mean, the, the moment, um, during that, uh, that, that time period of the 60s, I think it was both the moment where things started to go very far afield, but it was also the time when the currents of pushback began. Um, and it's interesting to see your NASA's, your Jet Propulsion Labs really as a um, kind of center point of a civil rights movement that we typically don't talk about, but folks in that industry who were simply recognizing the obvious. There are not people, many people like me in this place. To the degree that there are, we are technicians at the lowest rungs and have no say in what's going on or decisions being made uh, up here. Um, and so a current sort of begins of pushback, and those are connected to what's happening at um, higher ed institutions like MIT, push for different reasons for MIT, for instance, and another, a lot of other higher ed institutions. That's the assassination of uh, MLK in 68 that gets people to think and realize, oh, maybe we should be thinking about something differently and asking ourselves a question, why aren't cer certain parts of our um, country represented um, in our universities? Um, you also had, um, the places like the Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, who's just starting out in 68, but mandating that these large companies, particularly IBM and others in the tech sector, diversify its workforce. And there too, you begin to see currents of pushback of people that say, hey, I belong here, I have the aptitude to be here, but I am not represented. And so there's a lot sort of bubbling under the surface at that moment that builds continuously to something, but it, it has its starts there. But interestingly enough, we never, you know, we never hear that story. We never hear this, uh, the hidden figure story about those who are the heroes and heroines there, but we also don't hear about the small but critical masses of people that are starting to foment this kind of revolution as it were. Anyone else? Do you have anything? <laughs> do we have time for one more? Yes, we do. Okay, All I don't right. know when we're going to get cut off. Okay, let me just end then with the question. One of the really um, important strands here is a kind of prehistory of um, the kind of predictive policing apparatus that a lot that's on you know a lot of people's minds. And so I wonder if you can um, just give us a sense in which the, the concerns we have today around that and the way that it's sort of centered in public discourse has meant many of its roots are found, like the, the early part of that is found here. Maybe you could just give us a taste to whet people's appetites to make them want to buy the book. <laughs> in, indeed. I'll, maybe I'll do it this way. Yeah. So about a year or so ago, some of you may have seen The Intercept came out with this investigative report that basically talked about how the NYPD had lent, lent its uh, image recognition uh, uh, data to IBM. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for the purpose of building a an AI uh, facial recognition system that could identify people by race. And the crux of the story was, A, this is happening and this is kind of messed up. And B, this has been going on under wraps for five years. And I remember the moment of reading that and thinking and smiling and laughing a little bit to say, oh, you don't even understand. This is not a five-year project. It's a 50 year one, and not in just general terms, but in very detailed, specific ways, a 50-year project of which this is the culmination or the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So doesn't that make you want to learn more? <laughs> <laughs> What's in there? What's in there? With that, I think we're going to transition to signing, right? OK, give, please give my colleague thank you. Charles McCone here. And if I could also end with just one quick thing, which is to say one of the things people also say, people often say, you know, you're such a pessimist. And I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> so what are you optimistic about? And this is a representation of just some of the things I'm optimistic about. The fact that five years ago, six years ago, when I started doing work in this area, you could find none of this. And so the fact that these are just a smattering of uh, work about conversations that are so dire and important for us around the issues of race and technology, the fact that we are pushing the envelope, raising the conversation uh, nationally, internationally, I think is reason for optimism. And if you haven't bought that one in the left <laughs> corner in the bottom, you recognize you should definitely get that one as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Strand.